Pastor Chris was, uh, Clayton preached last week, beginning our series on hashtag winning. And uh, for those of you who weren't here, he preached 54 minutes. Just, just want it to be on the record. Okay? It's, so what he does, he had the people who sang, sang less so that he could speak more. He manipulated the numbers a little bit. So you can mark your... Your watch is now. It will not be 54 minutes. Um, the, the premise behind this series of hashtag winning is, is we began with, you know, our relationship with God and, and how, um, how worship impacts our relationship. And that there are five, at least five key relationships that we have and uh, the ones that we want to win and succeed at. The first most important one because it's foundational because we'll be, be a relationship with the Lord. Then becomes the second most valuable relationship, the most valuable earthly relationship is in husband and wife. We're going to talk about marriage today. Next week for Mother's Day, Pastor Jen is actually going to speak on, um, on parenting. And then we're going to go to, these might seem an odd fit, but then our relationship at work, how we relate with work, not your work folks that you work with, but how we, how we relate to work in general. And then the outcropping of that would be the money, how our relationship with money. And all five of those I find are really a key to even winning, winning at life. Now, um, because marriage is such a, a crucial relationship, there's a lot of jokes about marriage. And, and I wanted to try to even find a, c- a comparison. So I started looking at, well, are there as many jokes about marriage as, are, are, as there are two men walk into a bar? And, and then I got sidetracked on reading all of the jokes about two men walking into a bar. My favorite was, was two men walk into a bar and one ducked. And that was, um, <laughs> it, it took the nine o'clock a little while to get that one too. It's kind of kind of rippled. It started at the front. And it kind of made its way made its way to the back. But my, my favorite marriage joke. I, I've told it plenty of times, so so excuse it if you've already heard it. But um, husband and wife are having a marital issues. They go to see a counselor. They go in to see the counselor. They sit down. The counselor gives the, the wife the first opportunity to share. Twenty five minutes of of nonstop complaints from the wife, where the husband is just sitting there, and he's just silent. After she finishes, the counselor just calmly gets up from behind his desk, walks around, takes her by the arms, lifts her out of the chair, and kisses her passionately for one minute. Then he sets her down in her chair. He walks back around the desk, sits down, and he looks at the husband and says, she needs one of those three days a week. To which he responds, I can have her here every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday. <laughs> it's still the foolproof joke. It always works. It's always funny. Um, but because marriage then is such a significant relationship, then it comes with significant opposition. Sometimes just life in general opposition. Sometimes personality opposition. But there's also there's spiritual opposition to marriage. And so I wanted to look at, at least for me, what I considered three keys. There's probably 100 keys, but three keys that I considered important to winning at marriage. Priority. It's going to be the first one we're going to talk about. But then unity and intimacy. And really where I landed here is marriage is not complicated. Actually, marriage is simple. It's just not easy. The things I'm going to tell you today, you're going to, oh, yeah, I know that. Oh, yeah, I know that. It's it's not that it's going to be brand new stuff. Some of it might be. But it's not simple. I mean, it's not easy. We've got to work at marriage. Priority, the key passage I want to go with out of priority would be Ephesians 5, 1 and 2, and then we'll jump to 21 through 33. And uh, I want to read this out of the message version because Paul begins with um, the idea of how priority works with our relationship with the Lord first. He says, watch what God does and then you do it. Like children who learn proper behavior from the parents, mostly what God does is love you. Keep company with him and learn a life of love. Observe how Christ loved us. His love was not cautious, but extravagant. He didn't love in order to get something from us, but to give everything of himself to us, love like that. And it becomes the 
the beginning foundational piece that Paul teaches on how we ought to interact with one another, just non-spouses, how we would react with other people. He kind of ends that section and he puts a period on it by saying this. He says, out of respect for Christ, be courteous and reverent to one another. Translations would say, and sum, submit yourself to Christ and then submit yourself to one another. And so it concludes the passage on how we relate to one another, but it also actually serves as an introduction on how we are to engage with our spouses. And that's where we pick up on verses 22 and following. Wives, understand and support your husbands in ways that so show your support for Christ. The husband provides leadership to his wife the way Christ does to his church. The husband provides leadership to his wife the way Christ does to his church, not by domineering, but by cherishing. So just as the church submits to Christ and he exercises such leadership, wives should likewise submit to their husbands. Husbands, go all, go all out in your love for your wives, exactly as Christ did for the church. A love marked by giving, not getting. Christ's love makes the church whole. His words evoke her beauty. Everything he does and says is designed to bring the best out of her, dressing her in dazzling white silk, radiant with holiness. And that is how husbands ought to love their wives. They're really doing themselves a favor since they're already one in marriage. No one abuses his own body, does he? No, he feeds it, pampers it. That's how Christ treats us, the church, since we are part of his body. And this is why a man leaves father and mother and cherishes his wife. No longer two, they become one flesh. This is a huge mystery, and I don't pretend to understand it all. What is clearest to me is the way Christ treats the church. And this provides a good picture of how each husband is to treat his wife, loving himself and loving her, and how each wife is to honor her husband. Now, Nothing about today's new gender wars makes this idea of submission an almost palatable topic. And yet, these are the words that Paul uses. That we are to mutually submit to Christ and then mutually submit to one another. Um, ladies, God created you with an innate need for security. Now, it's not that you need a man to take care of you, but when you do have a man as a husband, their love uniquely fits that need and fills that need for security. Gentlemen, God created you with the innate need for honor and respect. And what I've seen is I can have any honor and respect outside of the home but if I don't have it in the home, it still trashes me. But if I have it in the home, it doesn't matter how anybody treats me outside of that. Isn't it interesting that Paul does not tell the wife to love her husband? Why is that? It's because the way a husband receives love from his spouse is through honor and respect. And in no time does it say, Husbands, honor and respect your wives. Because when we love and cherish our wife, as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her, there is the honor and respect. But Paul is addressing the core innate needs that a husband and a wife have. One jab, ladies, one dismissive comment. It's amazing what that can unravel in what you think is your strong husband. Gentlemen, choosing ourselves over our spouse. It's amazing the toll that takes. So that's why I consider priority, this idea of priority being a key to this relationship. We make Christ priority. We make one another our priority. So husbands, submission to our wives looks like cherishing and loving. Ladies, it looks like honor and respect. And here's what I find fascinating here. In this version, at least, Paul uses 34 words to convey this concept to all the wives in the room. 34 words. Gentlemen, 
He uses 196 words plus word pictures. I'm not sure all of what that communicates. Ladies, get it faster than us. We need pictures. But it's an interesting thing that when you count through, it takes five times as long to try to communicate the same thing to us, to us men. So to be clear, here it is. Submitting to your husband looks like prioritizing his foundational need for honor and respect as unto the Lord. Submitting to our wives looks like prioritizing her foundational need to be loved above ourselves with the same kind of sacrificial love that Christ loved the church. You can't skip this key and ever hope to maximize the next two, unity and intimacy in marriage. You know, there's the big deal now. You'll see blogs and articles about hacks, um, you know, home maintenance hacks, car, you know, maintenance hack. Uh, everything has a hack to it. There are no hacks to marriage. There are, there, there are no shortcuts. And it starts with priority. It's interesting that, um, so because um, submission is the goal um, for priority or marriage, choosing ourselves or choosing the other person over ourselves, then the, the thing that works against that most is what I see is stubbornness. Stubbornness is ends up what works against submission. And that is this decision of, well, I'm not receiving this from her, so I'm not going to give this to her. I'm not receiving this from him, so I'm not going to give this to him. And that's what I see. I see that kind of stubbornness. In 30 years of pastoral ministry, I see this happen all the time. Well, I, you know, it's just kind of like, well, you know, I'll move when he moves. Well, I'll move when she moves. What's fascinating about this passage of Scripture in Ephesians is there's no talk of reciprocity in this passage. It's about priority. It's not an if-then statement. It's about priority. And here is what I have found. When finally one partner decides, well, you know what? I am mutually submitting to Christ, so I will honor and respect regardless of what I'm receiving in return. What I see now is I see that wife walking towards the husband, and then the gap, which we'll find intimacy, is, is this gap between us, okay? And as the gap narrows, that's what intimacy is, okay? And then it starts to return because we've reduced the gap. And what I have found most often, it doesn't happen all the time, but most often what that ends up doing is softening the other party, and they turn, and now both parties are reducing the gap. Are you with me? So stubbornness is the enemy to priority. Submission is the antidote to that enemy. All right, let's talk about unity. Here are the foundational passages, Genesis 2, 18 through 24. The Lord God said, It's not good for the man to be alone. I will make a helper suitable for him. Now the Lord God had formed out of the ground all the wild animals and all the birds in the sky, and he brought them to the man to see what he would name them. And whatever the man called each living creature, creature that was its name. So the man gave names to all the livestock, the birds in the sky, and all the wild animals. But for Adam, no suitable helper was found. So the Lord God caused the man to fall into a deep sleep, and while he was sleeping, he took one of the man's ribs, then closed up the place with flesh. Then the Lord God made a woman from the rib he had taken out of the man, and he brought her to the man. The man said, This is now bone of my bones, flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman, for she was taken out of man. That is why a man leaves his father and mother, as united to his wife, and they become one flesh. Adam and his wife were both naked, and they felt no shame. One flesh, they became unified. It is the most difficult thing of marriage, is taking two people and can making one person out of the two. It's the first time in the Genesis account where God says something wasn't good. He creates the light and the darkness. He creates this and that. He says, it is good. And he says, creates man. He says, not, it is not good. Basically, he's saying it's not complete. It's not that he got caught off guard that man didn't really do good, very good by himself. It was the three things, tasks that were given in Genesis to man to do was only going to be accomplished by man and a woman. And so he creates Eve. Now, here's where the English language kind of short circuits the power of this passage because it said he needed a suitable helper. Suitable. 
We use suitable like, well, that will do. All right? Can, we're having meatloaf for dinner. Is that okay? Well, it's, it'll do. And it's suitable. Um, I've, loved, I've loved suits all my life. I mean, in the, in, when I preached Easter, you know, I told, I, if you were here for Easter, I told a story a family story, and so I had to do the research in the family. So I had aunt, I had uncles and aunts sending me all kinds of pictures for this, and there was one like I never remember going ever going to church with my dad. Okay, and here was the Easter picture. Apparently, my dad had a red sport coat on. Who knew? You know, so he had red sport coat on, had tie, dressed with my mom. My mom's in this pink dress, and here I am with my my Air Force haircut, like my dad. My dad had this Air Force haircut, so I had this Air Force haircut, and I had this little jacket on and pants and a little bow tie. I've always loved suits. But I've never had a suit tailor-made for me. Now, I've had t- well, tailored suits. You buy them off a rack, right? And I've bought a suit off the rack. I like that. Now I'm 42 regular. It hasn't always been that way. But I get that suit off the rack, but then they do some tailoring, right? I put on the pants, and they, do you want a cuff? Do you not want a cuff? Where do you want, the, where do you want it to break on, at your shoe? I always love that question. Where do you want the crease to break at your shoe? I'm a suit nerd. And then they you know, take, in the, take in the back a little bit or take in the, the waist, and they put the jacket on the jacket. Oh, I love the jacket part. The jacket part, then they, they want to see how long do you want to, how much of your shirt cuff do you want to see? So, like, you know, I like cufflinks, so when I wear cufflinks, I want a little bit more to see. I'm losing some of you. I can say, I'm going to go over here. So, and then, they can, and then they can move the button. They don't move the button up and down, but they, move the, they, they, move, they can move the button side to side. See, and I've had to have them do that some. Like, right, move the button side to side. But that is not a tailored suit. A tailored suit, when I'd walk into a tailor, and a tailor would show me reams and reams of fabric, and I would run, I'm just fantasizing here, and I'd, I'd, run, I'd run my hands down this fabric, and how they feel, and I would feel the weight of the fabric, and then the style, and then, and then I'd get to pick stitching. If it was a pick stitch, or it was a hidden stitch, and I'd, pick, I'd, I'd go to drawers of buttons, and I could have wood or bone, and I can, right? And that is a tailored suit. And when I would leave, he wouldn't measure the suit. He would measure me. And he would make the suit to be a perfect fit for me. So when, God, when it says that God created a suitable helper, he didn't create someone that will do. He created a perfect fit. A perfect fit. Now that's sounding a little better, isn't it, ladies? Perfect fit. Now helper. In our vernacular, a helper is someone who doesn't know as much as me is going to do the stuff I really don't want to do so I can do the stuff I want to do. That's, that's usually what we would carry helper. Ah, but when help is used in Scripture, all but three times it's used to refer to God, that God is the help. Okay, a little different about someone that's below me there, right? And the three times that it's not referring to God, it's referring to a military campaign in which there is a force coming against a nation And that nation, it's not that that nation is inferior. It is that nation isn't large enough to accomplish the task. So another nation of equal size and strength come and together, together, it's not an inferior force coming. It's not a superior force coming. They're not coming to rescue. They're coming to help. And together they are greater than the force coming against them. Now here becomes the greatest picture of marriage, of this suitable helper, this perfect fit, this equal force, and together, together, nothing then can stand against us. Stubbornness works against priority. Selfishness works against unity. Come on up, Gina. Gina will tell you that she's never preached with me. The question is she has... She just doesn't like to. All right, here. I didn't want to spend my vacation working on the plane. Because <laughs> I was prioritizing her need for beach. All right. So, so, I see this, so I see this a lot in marriages. So we have this rope, and the marriage becomes this tug of war. Okay? Tug of war. And so there, when we both are stubborn and we're both selfish, then we both are pulling against one another. Okay? So then here comes the thing you get told a lot. Well, marriage is a compromise, right? You get told marriage is a compromise. So there are times where, well, I'll let Gina, I'll give, I'll, I'll give in to her way. And then there are times where I want her to give in to my way. Hey, but guys, listen, giving in and going with are two completely different things. And I would say a compromise marriage, while it might keep some peace, 
It is not a covenant marriage. It's not a marriage that loves and prioritizes the other person. And it isn't one that works on unity. But look, this robe, this robe then actually can become something that keeps us together. Solomon talks about this in Ecclesiastes. He talks about that, that one cord can be easily broken. Two cords, maybe not so much, but three cords will never be broken. He talks about the advantages of two versus one. He says, he says well, two has better return on their work. They can get more done. And it talks about that when they're, they're cold, they, they can lie down together and they can be warm. And, and so you can maybe see this on adventure channels where it's people climbing maybe a cliff or, or climbing up a, a mountain and they're tied together in a rope. Why? Safety. Safety. If one falls, the other will know, and then they will not be able to, they, you know, they'll be safe. Or you see sometimes maybe in dark areas or down corridors, there's a rope, and then they'll follow the rope together. And then, you know, Solomon's words, then we can be tied together by this rope. Selfishness works against that. Thank you, baby. Selfishness works against that. Um, Anyone have children under the age of five? Under age of five, raise your hand. Okay, we all, if you have children, they've all been there, so you'll remember, but this will strike very much at home from you guys. Have you ever had to teach your child to say mine? Have you ever had to teach your child to say no? Have you ever had to orchestrate and choreograph a tantrum when they didn't get their way? Never. Selfishness, I mean, it is rooted down in all of us. So it means it has to be dug out for two to become one. It is the biggest enemy of one, selfishness. So there are at least two different ways to to kind of attack selfishness. One would be having a family kind of plan. Call it a mission and vision, if you will. For the family. And here's what I mean by that. If, if we have, let's say, you know, if we have a, a, a goal, let's even call it a, fi- we have had a financial goal. If we had a financial goal in our home, and it's our goal, and then I go out and want to buy new golf clubs, that goes against our goal, well, wait a minute. We have, we have this goal, Charlie. We're trying to get to this, and well, you're right. That doesn't fit the goal. It's, a, it's, a, it's called a plan. Only in the movies, only in the movies can people shoot from the hip and hit moving targets. Only in the movies. For you and I, if we're going to hit a moving target, which is life, we got to have a plan. And we work together on that plan. And the plan, something we've already discussed, everything goes through that filter because we're unified on that plan, right? So working together as a married couple on a plan, raising kids, career, finance, whatever, how we're going to raise these kids. All of this goes in this unified plan that we work out together. And then the second thing that roots against selfishness, helps root out selfishness, is practice. Say, I told you this would be mind-blowing stuff. Practice. Now, an athletic euphemism would be you will play how you practice. You're going to slop through practice. You're going to slop through a game. You are, you are hustling at practice. You are, you are paying attention at practice. You're learning at practice. Then you will respond. I'll never forget, Patrick, you telling me one time, it wasn't, what, it wasn't knowing what to do. It was the instinct to do it without thinking. Some phrase of that you mentioned to me when you played. And so that's the idea that when I practice, when I practice, when I practice making her a priority, when I practice unity, when I practice, then when the pressure gets on the system, see, you can go through marriage fine until you hit pressure. When you hit pressure into the system, it shows where the cracks are. And that's a good thing. That doesn't have to be a bad thing. It can be a good thing if you don't blow a gasket. Because you can go back and find out where the cracks were, and you can go now, two together, attack that crack. When I practice and I practice and I practice, that helps with my unity. Here's the last one. Last one is intimacy. Intimacy. So we have priority, unity, and intimacy. Intimacy is God's ultimate target for our relationship with our spouse. And listen, our relationship with him. 
Here's how Paul paints this picture in Philippians out of the Amplified Version. For my determined purpose is that I may know him, that I may progressively become more deeply and intimately acquainted with him, perceiving and recognizing and understanding the wonders of his person more strongly, more clearly, and that I may be in that same way come to know him and his power, his power outflowing from his resurrection. This is Paul discussing his relationship with God and the intimacy that God desires for us and he wants for him. And when we come up here with the foundational understanding of intimacy, intimacy is knowing and understanding. Now, most of the time when the word intimacy comes up, men think it's code word for sex. You can, that's funny. You're afraid to laugh at the word sex in church. Okay. But understand that every word for a man is code word for sex. It is true. But sex doesn't produce intimacy. Intimacy is a, is, a, um, is a byproduct, or sex is a byproduct of intimacy. God designed sex for intimacy. So look, this is why it doesn't work outside of the confines of marriage. Because it's using it outside of the context in which it was created and the purpose which is created, which means when it's used outside that context, it doesn't produce what it was designed to produce. In fact, what it does is harm all situations. It doesn't help. Because sex is supposed to be a product of intimacy. It doesn't create it. Our research and development has produced so many things to help protect against the physical ramifications of sex outside of marriage, but it has never produced anything to handle the spiritual and the emotional impact when sex is used outside of its design. Mark Twain talked about intimacy. He said it this way, Love seems the swiftest, but it is the slowest of all growths. No man or woman really knows what perfect love is until they've been married a quarter of a century. Why is that? Because intimacy is knowledge. Knowledge takes time. It's an exploration. So our wedding anniversary last week was our 28th. She was 25. I was 27 when we got married. So she's been married longer than she's been single longer than I have. This was my first time to be married longer than I have been single. It was kind of a milestone for me. I thought, wow, this 28 years, now I've known life together longer than life apart and that was a good thing and that's what so intimacy is supposed to grow over time not decrease over time because time is one of the things that produces intimacy so because of that what then are the things that work against intimacy there's probably plenty but I've identified three okay the first would be sin sin any kind of sin think about it when Adam and Eve sin they experienced an emotion they had never experienced before. The emotion was shame. The response to shame was that they hid. Now, so the distance created between God and his creation wasn't instigated by God or followed up by God. God came back. He came to that day to the garden like he had come to interact with creation. And yet because of their sin, they hid they were shamed, and it created the distance that they could not fix, but God fixes it. How does God fix it? God fixes that distance by giving himself and forgives. The way we access forgiveness is through repentance. So sin is an, is, is an enemy to intimacy, but it has an answer in repentance and forgiveness. Ladies and gentlemen, in your marriage relationship, when one party repents, it needs to be met with forgiveness. So many times I hear and see it met, met with a rehashing and a rehashing of past. 
Now, I understand saying I'm sorry is different than repentance. You need to listen to me because I know I'm messing with people here. I'm sorry sometimes is just trying to get off an emotional hook. But repentance is a change of heart and a change of direction. And when there is a change of a heart and a change of direction, the way that gets encouraged is through forgiveness. That's the antidote to sin. The second enemy to intimacy are secrets. Secrets. Think about it. If, if knowledge, if knowledge is one way that we become intimate, then it makes sense that secrets are withholding of knowledge. And so it becomes then a gap in intimacy. And here's what else secrets does. Secrets lead to lies. Because it takes a lie many times to cover up a secret. And then that one lie, to cover up that one secret, turns into a series of lies that covers up the secret. And that breaks trust. And trust is a key ingredient to intimacy. Now, there's a lot of reasons why we keep secrets. But none of them are good reasons. Because they all hurt intimacy. So the way way secrets gets counteracted in a marriage is trust. If we will build enough trust that when I say the secret, that we'll deal with the secret and it won't cause. Okay? Last one, silence. My parents were old enough where they held to the, um, they held to the adage that they did all their fighting behind closed doors, which basically meant I didn't think my parents ever fought until I went to college. And when I went to college, and my mom said to me, now I think that freshman, 800 miles away, drops me off, and told me she didn't think she was going back home. Because they all their fights were behind closed doors. Silence is one of the ways people fight. We learn to fight based on how either we've seen our parents fight, or we learn to fight based on our personalities. Okay, so I didn't learn how to fight fair because I never saw my parents fight. I'm told in premarital counseling, the best premarital counseling is to pick a fight and watch how they deal with it. Because most of the issues in marriage are going to come down to how you fight, how do you resolve conflict, okay, and how you communicate to one another. Almost all of them boil down to those two things. My personality, believe it or not, is a little bit forward. In confrontation. Other than that, I'm basically, I really am almost an introvert. But in confrontation, I get about three inches taller. And I, I, have, I can talk. I talk. That's my calling. So I can use words really, really well. Gina is quiet. Her personality is quiet. So early on in our marriage, if I got verbal, she got Quiet, quiet, please do not misunderstand, quiet is meek. That is not a word that I would describe my wife with. Her silence turned into fun. Sure. And so that doesn't make for an intimate marriage, does it? And then we learned something. We learned that we were the exact opposite in personality and equally on equal sides of the extreme of that trait. And when we learn that, oh, well, maybe she's a perfect fit. And maybe I need to back off, and we need to figure out how this perfect fit works to win. And we did. And it's amazing when you understand how your spouse is wired and you realize you aren't supposed, uh, she's not supposed to change me and I'm not supposed to change her. We're supposed to figure out this together. And obviously, the rough edges get burned off as we go. It's not that I just say, this is how I am. I'm not changing. But there is a core part of my personality that's ingrained and we learn how to work together on that 
Silence, is, silence works against marriage intimacy, but active listening is the anecdote. See, so many times we want to talk to be heard, but what wins at marriage is listening. I want to listen to understand. And so active listening becomes the art of asking good questions. And even if I get agitated or anxious or, or, or upset and she asks, starts asking me the right questions, it's amazing how my blood pressure starts to go down. And I start li- coming outside of living in the, um, the fantasy world that we, we create when things are going wrong. You with me? And it gets down to the reality of really what's happening. And she gets me off Def- DEFCON 5 because she asks good questions and she wants to understand why I am feeling the way I'm feeling. And now we're working together again. And it works the other way around. It's just she doesn't ever get to DEFCON 5 like I do. But it works the other way. Active listening is what negates silence or even loud fighting in a marriage. She shared this with me this past week. Um, said that unmet expectations are a breeding ground for offenses in relationships. Unmet expectations are a breeding ground for offenses in relationships. Right? So if I expect this and I get this, this is the gap. That gap is what creates all the frustration and anger and pain and all that. Okay. But then, then here was the part. She said then unexpressed expectations are a breeding ground for unmet expectations in relationship. So did you get that? We can't read each other's minds. And so when we, active listening becomes active sharing, and in that there becomes intimacy. So let's go over here. They are again. Priority is opposed by stubbornness, and it's countered by submission. Unity. Unity is opposed by selfishness, and it's countered by having a plan and and practice. And the last one, intimacy. Intimacy is opposed by sin, secrets, and silence. And the antidotes are repentance, trust, and active listening. And the reason why marriage is so hard is because it is the one human relationship that best expresses Christ's love for us. It is the picture given to the world of what being loved by Christ and loving Christ looks like. And so why wouldn't it be the most attacked relationship that there is? Because what the enemy gets to do is destroy you and another image of his relationship with the body. Marriage is not complicated. It's simple. It's just not easy. So we're ending this service with communion. If you were here for Palm Sunday, Pastor Harry and I shared the message where I talked about uh, Palm Sunday being the Sunday in which um, Israel set aside the lamb that was going to be uh, roasted for the Thursday Passover meal, the Seder meal. And Jesus enters into the city on that very day, no coincidence. And then Pastor Harry took the back half of that message and talked about how with Passover, Christ used language that turned, that turned the remembrance celebration on its ear. And here's how. He began using language that was used in the engagement ceremony of a man and a woman. So when he came to, they came to the third cup in Passover, the cup of redemption. He changes the language of that cup and he said, this is a new covenant. This is a new covenant between me and you by my blood. Whoa, that was a different way to say that. And they would not have missed the inference. The inference was, and if I just put it back in Gina, in in the characterization of me and Gina, my dad, Wayne, would have gone to her father, Jim, 
and they would have negotiated a bride price for Gina. Now, it wasn't an, an attempt to buy Gina. What it was, it was an attempt to replace the value of Gina in Jimmy and Jean's home. And when Wayne and Jimmy would have finished that arrangement, my dad would have came and poured a glass of wine for me to offer to Gina. He was saying, son, this arrangement's been made. Now it's time for you to make it with Gina. I would extend the cup to Gina, and I would say, this is a covenant, and it's in my blood. In, in, in essence, it's saying, all of me, I'm giving all of me to you. Now, she had two choices. She could have refused to drink from the cup, and by just that very action, she'd be saying, I don't want you, and I don't want to give myself to you. And yet, if she takes the cup, all she has to do is drink the cup. And when she drinks the cup, what she's saying is, I receive all of you, and I give you all of me in return. He turned the whole ceremony on its ear. It wasn't just about what God had done in the deliverance from Egypt. It was about what he was about to do with his arrest that night. It's why when I do weddings, and I do weddings between two believers, I really encourage them to do communion. And most of the time I get a blank stare because we see communion so much as sometimes, well, it's just something we do at church because we, for some reason, we don't necessarily grasp the power of that moment. And the power of the moment that, that God tells us to repeat often, to remember that this is what he's given us. And when we take it together as a couple, I see it as I'm mutually, we're mutually submitting ourselves to Christ and we're, mutually, and we're submitting ourselves to one another. It becomes a, a double reminder for me. So uh, ushers, those are going to come and distribute the elements. So today we will pass this plate. The, the cups are nested together. The bottom cup holds the, the wafer, the little cracker, and the, the, the other cup, the top cup, holds the juice, okay? And so I just ask it, everybody, when you, when you get it, just hold it, and then I'll come back up, and I will direct us in receiving communion. I belong to Jesus, a blessed mystery, the vilest of all sinners now. Forgiven and redeemed. And oh, the depths of darkness as love would reach down through to cover me with mercy and hide me in his words. Oh, hallelujah. Oh, bless his name. Ten thousand years will just begin my song of praise oh hallelujah sing it again oh, I belong to Jesus oh, I belong to him and I belong to Jesus the cross that once was mine Became the curse that he would bear And give to me new life And I am his forever Forever he is mine My freedom bought and paid for By his blood divine Oh hallelujah Oh bless his name Ten thousand years will just begin my song of praise. Oh, hallelujah. Sing it again. I belong to Jesus. I belong to Him. We sing out. Oh, hallelujah. Oh, bless His name. And ten thousand years will just Begin my song of praise. Oh, hallelujah. Sing it again. And 
belong to Jesus. I belong to Him. And I belong to Jesus. I belong to Him. As Matthew records this. While they were eating, Jesus took bread and gave thanks and broke it. Gave it to his disciples saying, take and eat. This is my body. Let's take it to the body of Christ. And he took the cup, he gave thanks, and he offered it to them, saying, Drink from it, all of you. This is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. I tell you, I will not drink of this fruit of the vine from now until the day when I drink it anew with you in my Father's kingdom. Let's receive the blood of Christ. Father, we mutually submit to you and to one another. It says, then when they had sung a hymn, they went out to the Mount of Olives. Just stand and let's sing this one more time. And oh, hallelujah. And oh, bless his name. 10,000 years will just begin my song of praise. Oh, hallelujah, sing it again. Because I belong to Jesus, I belong to Him. And I belong to Jesus, I belong to Him. If you're a guest with us today, it's been great having you part of our worship service. I know it's never easy walking into a new place, so we're grateful for you taking a chance on us. We have a gift for you. Um, it's not going to change your life, uh, it, but it is a way in which we can express that we're happy that you came today. We were expecting you. Um, now for the benediction. Well, did I tell you where that was? Outside these double doors. Did I say that? I might not have. All right. Now the benediction. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May he make his face shine on you, be gracious to you, and grant you peace. And you're rising up, and you're laying down, you're going out, coming in, both now and forevermore. God bless you. Enjoy your Sunday afternoon.